Welcome to the summit. I'm Shola Ajay. The summit is a program designed to deconstruct the economic, political, and social cultural questions of the current Nigerian society. Summit will do this by framing every debate and inquisitive minds of the interlocutors and bringing them to bear on the pros and cons of the prevailing state of affairs. Our desire is not to leave you, the viewers, in any doubt as to the aim of any subject matter, no matter how complex or esoteric the details might be. Our goal is the truth. Summit will rebrand Nigeria, even though we all know it needs rebranding. Our intention is to create a forum whereby subjects of our time can be given robust treatments as to leave the viewers no doubt that the truth matters to the citizenry of Nigeria, and that the notion of public accountability is the pivot on which the democratic wheel spins. Summit is not to editorialize an all-consuming subject matter, but to create a moment of enlightenment by arbitrating between the supporters of the views, opposing views, and in the last analysis, illuminate the various issues that pulsate the views of the Republic. Welcome to the summit. I'm Shola J. Although the nuclear force of the two atomic bombs forced the Asian nation of Japan to surrender to the United States in 1945, bringing a welcoming end to the Second World War, that nation is now well regarded globally. And the reason is not even because of its military might because Japan still depends on the United States for its security. Most countries do business with Japan and take the Japanese seriously today because this nation of men and women who are curiously below the average height of most other nations have managed to build one of the largest and most industrialized economies in the world. Interestingly, there was a debate over the strong correlation between steel production and industrialization. What is happening in Japan provides conclusive evidence to settle the matter. The Japanese economy proves that steel is so important that an industrialized nation will have to produce it anyway if they are not blessed with two of the natural resources required for steel production, namely iron ore and coal. Not many people realize that Although Japan is the second largest producer of steel in the world, Japan's steel industry survives by importing virtually everything required. On Nigerians part, not only does Nigeria have iron ore in several states of the federation like Kogi, Kwara and Plateau states, and coal in Enugu and other places, Nigeria was fortunate to have built and commissioned a world-class steel complex barely 23 years ago after her independence. But that is where the good news ends. Through a series of missteps that seem inspired by the incantations of a voodoo ritualist, Nigeria has failed to utilize its advantages for progress in this sector. Early this year, Abubakar Bawa Buari, who is the Minister of State for Steel Development Industry, told the Senate committee that Nigeria currently imports over 4 million tons of rolled steel products for the construction industry and over 12 million tons of other steel products. Because steel is used in building railways, the minister also said that the country could save over $5 billion annually if Ajakuta could be brought back on stream. That amount is almost two trillion naira. To drive home his point, which was in favor of reviving the Nigerian steel industry, the minister claimed that Nigeria had spent upwards of $10 billion since the days of the Second Republic. When the foundation for Jakuta was laid by the Sheo Shagari administration, the current sole administrator of Jakuta Steel Complex also added his voice to the discourse by publicly asserting that Ajakuta had the potential to provide 500,000 upstream 
and downstream employment if it became operational. Before steel was invented in the 1740s by a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Huntsman, it was iron that was used for machinery. Steel is the in thing today because steel is not only tougher than iron, making it better for machinery, but also lighter, cheaper, and stronger than iron making it ideal for all sorts of purposes. Steel also plays a greater role in the making of railroads. Consumer products such as home appliances and kitchen utensils are made of steel to ensure durability. Steel is used to package materials and transport energy resources such as oil and natural gas. So, it is no-brainer to ask if steel will revolutionize the Nigerian economy, because it will, in such a drastic way, only sufficient power supply can rival. Steel production will positively affect the construction industry, rail building, aviation, and especially the automobile industry. As a matter of fact, both Tata and Mahindra Motors of India started as steel production companies Today, Mahindra not only makes cars, but is one of the largest manufacturers of tractors in the world, with total assets amounting to over $9 billion. But while serious nations are making a killing out of steel, Nigeria is still considering whether to concession the Ajakuta steel plant, do a joint venture, or even sell the place off. In fact, the Bureau of Public Enterprises recently suggested that the steel plant should be unbundled and given to different investors since the cost of a single core investor taking it over will be huge, even by global standards and potentially discouraging. For some reasons that remain unclear, Ajaokuta was more or less abandoned during the Babangida regime. When Obasanjo came to power, he tried to do something and had a deal with an Indian company known as Global Infrastructure Holdings Limited, or GIHL. But for reasons best known to him, President Yaradua terminated that contract shortly after he came to power. As expected, GIHL took the Nigerian government to the International Court of Arbitration and a legal battle ensued. When good luck Jonathan came to power, his government initiated the process of a modified agreement with GIHL as part of an out-of-court settlement for the government's breach of the original agreement signed in 2004. It was not until the 1st of August last year that a deal was signed with GIHL by the Buhari regime, bringing the fireworks to an end. Welcome to the summit. Um, I have with me Al Haji Issa Buka. Uh, he was former general manager, just Steel Rolling Mill. And he was also former general manager, Katsina Steel Rolling Mill. Uh, Al Haji Buka is an economist by training. Also, is barrister Natasha Hadiza Apoti. Uh, she's a social entrepreneur and founder, Builders Hub. Impact Investment Program, a social reformative platform which advocates for the revival of neglected industries and wealth creation. Tene Naksa of Leadership Newspapers. Uh, she is um, an agriculture and solid minerals correspondent. And then we have Dan D. Kunle, a business consultant and privatization advisor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Last week, we had an explosive discussion about the inability of Nigeria to generate power. We had people on the set from the Jenkos, the Discos. Um, of course, we couldn't get the uh, transmission company of Nigeria to also be present, nor could we get uh, uh, any ROC to be part of the show. But today, I think uh, we are lucky to have people like yourselves who have knowledge about what happened to our steel company. Al-Haji Bukhar, 
you have been at this long enough as general manager of the two important steel mills. What happened with all the billions to Ajakuta Steel? What happened to everything in Nigeria? That's a deep question. <laughs> the people. Nigerians are not ready to do what they should do. You know, I do not want to be personal with anybody, but the vision and mission of our founding fathers are no longer in, in us. We have jettisoned all those great characteristics of great human beings for, for greed. So-called politicians, greedy politicians who are insulting us. It's an insult on us, on citizens of Nigeria, that things go wrong and we still vote people to that place. What has happened all these years? The good old fathers, our founding fathers, thought it wise that there should be still plants because there is no nation in the world, no country in the world, that industrializes without a steel base. You have to have steel base in order to industrialize. And that is why our founding fathers found it you know, right, proper, to plan steel plants projects in Ajakuta. The ones in Jaws, Kasina and Oshobo are only mills, they are not steel plants. They are to reprocess the, uh, the products of the steel plants. So, what happened? What happened is a pain, a great pain about we, about Nigerians. What, I'll just be brief about this. There's a story. Somebody said, even England, a lot of countries around Nigeria, and even those in the West, were jealous of Nigeria. It's supposed to be a joke. Why, and, and was, Asking God, why do you put so much resources in Nigeria? And you little in our own land. God answer, replied and said, wait, and let me show you. You will see the people that, I, that will be there. <laughs> now, if this is now, this is a joke, but right. it's turning to be, a reality. you know, proving to be something that is with us. I don't think there's anything that happens. What happens is the people's Nigerian leadership determination to get things done. We are not doing things that we should do. You have been very much an advocate for a long time about how to get, whether it's power, whether it's a steel mill. You've been an advocate for quite some time. What went wrong? I've been a student of steel development for almost 25 years now. Consciously, I, I, am, a, I, am, a, I am a business consultant. I had no background in metallurgy, but I took it upon myself to find out. And I discovered that the human evolution has been associated with iron. So steel has been part of human evolution. In Nigeria, 150 million people there about. I think they say we're about 180 million. Right? Some Let say us more. be scientific <laughs> with our pronouncement. Yeah. Let's say Nigeria is 150 million, <laughs> less there about. Mm. If you cannot produce steel for 150 million people, it will be very sad because this iron and steel sector is supposed to take like 3 million people of the market. Agriculture and other like, if you have mechanized agriculture, you shouldn't have more than 10 million people in agriculture in this country, if you have mechanized agriculture. And if you don't develop your steel, you cannot have mechanized agriculture. So when you see modern society in the last 700 years, you will see the role steel have played in their life. You build ships, you build aircraft, it's steel. So I, when I took pains to go to Ajakuta on my own as a business consultant, 
I came out of a job very depressed. I was very young, 1993, 94, 95. So I anchored a national workshop there. Dr. Tom Miyachi was the uh, acting and did that. And it was very sad what I saw there. I, I f did my homework. I discovered the colossal amount of money that had gone into that complex. And, and I felt that this project should be completed for whatever it is worth. That was what brought me into steel development advocacy. In United States of America, just go to your YouTube and the, the, the Bethlehem Steel the people that built America. All that you see today, they came out of that place. Because, and I continue to tell people, we built automobile assembly plant across Nigeria, from Volkswagen in Okokomaiko in Lagos, to Leyland in Ibadan, automobile in Kaduna, to Fiat National Truck Manufacturing Company in Kano, to Stair in Bauchi, to Anamco in Enugu. But no, nobody realizes that each of those vehicles, they are just meta boxes. And you have 150 million people, you are developing a steel project, no flash sheet. <coughs> if there is no flash sheet, what are you going to use to build the box so that you can put engine inside? You, you understand me now? So all these things, <coughs> when, I, when I further punish myself to dig into the history of iron and steel and how it has helped to transform humanity. The humongous vessels that are carrying 150,000 tons across the oceans and seas today, the hull is all steel. It's all steel. So I, I felt very, very sad that up to this moment, Steel project. But again, in, in comparative analysis, do we really have comparative advantage to produce steel? Yes, but do you have the competitive advantage to produce steel? No. By the infrastructural provisions available in this country today, still competitively. You have no deep sea port to bring in materials competitively. You have no deep sea port for you to move things out competitively. You have no railway to move heavy material. Your river roads, I hope you understand what I mean by river roads. Your inland waterways, the river roads are not dread. They can carry heavy loads. China developed the longest man-made canal in the world, 1,000 kilometers, man-made canal, to move heavy materials to build Beijing. The canal is still live canal till today. So I, I just discovered that along the line, I have gotten more mature now. I, I am advancing in knowledge and age and experience. I discovered that we had, Nigeria had made an experience Expensive mistake since 1966. Because when I restudied the political economy of Nigeria, I discovered that when we were in regions, four regions, the regions were developing along what we call capital, uh, public capitalism. And the private capitalists that time were few. In the north, it was Dantata. In the southwest, it was the Odutolas. That is the family capitalism. But it was public capitalism that the government of each region were promoting. That was how Chief Obafemi Awula built the Ikeja Industrial Estate, built some corridors in Apapa, built, I hope it was, it was public. So since 1966, that the whole thing was entering into a big political tumor because the tripod in Nigeria could not, could not fashion out how they were going to live with one another. Sedates. Take each succeeding president since that time today. All other ones, President Obasanjo had the best 11 years, 11 and a half years. 
So if you take these three that had the best opportunity, and yet they could not move Nigeria into intermediate level of industrialization, particularly still com comparing us with, say, maybe Brazil, you will see that something is fundamentally wrong with us since 1966. Thank you. You've given a more depressing, um, <laughs> a more depressing <laughs> analysis. You know, but the fact is that is part of Nigerian uh, history. I'm coming to you now, uh, Natasha. There was that was given to the uh, company called the Global Infrastructure Holdings yeah. Limited. Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited, Global Steel Holdings Limited. They operate under three different names. Three different names. <laughs> what informed that? From what you know? Nepotism, corruption, lack of vision and mission, lack of purpose for actual the promotion of an inclusive economy. All of that led to the um, concession of Ajakuta and um, Niamco to a company that had no experience with steel plants just because they had a very close relationship with the president's son. Olusha Gombasanjo and Big Gombasanjo was actually their frontier. So that is it. And that was the very first mistake. Not the very first, say, the second biggest mistake in which we still are swimming in as a nation. Because we know um, after Obasanjo left, Yaradua terminated. Now, what informed that? Because they were involved, a Global um, Infrastructure Nigeria Limited was involved in a lot of um, economic damages in terms of crimes, of um, asset stripping, and sold off. Um, they cannibalized the steel plant and sold off uh, the billets and the ores to India and I think Liberia or Liberia, Liberia, Liberia mm -hmm. one of these, and record Nigeria. And like I said, all what they did was because there was lack of patriotism from the side of Nigeria for engaging these people who I could term criminals and then the uh, accountability on the part of our leaders to protect Nigerian citizens when it comes to the mode of doing business. Because there's these guidelines in the United Nations, it's called the Declaration of um, Human Rights. The state, I would say the state, which means Nigeria itself, owes an average, every Nigerian the right to protect their, human, their humanity when it comes to business operations. So therefore, Nigeria carefully um, investigated the capabilities of the so-called foreign investor before letting them into Ajakuta or Itape. And then by the time Nigerians were, actually the host community there had written several letters and information to late President Yaradua and uh, the ministry then complaining about the constant vandalization. What the government did, which was right then, was step in intervene to get the occurrences. And after that, the well, next thing the state should have done, what I'm mentioning now, actually contained in the documents, business and human rights, which is you have to um, investigate. And then the second, th the other thing the government should have done is to, the state owes Nigerians their duty to punish offenders in the course of business. And after punishing, the state should have redressed. So what Lady Aradua did was the first, the second part, investigate and apprehend that. So that was why he terminated. And if you recall, uh, Madame Root can, it been in the media, she can say and testify that it was, um, I think later I do actually called EFCC to get and uh, prosecute the offenders and promoters of Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited. And to an extent, EFCC did their job. They stepped in and arrested about four people while a number of them ran out of Nigeria. They took Nigeria to court. We had the arbitration in the ICC in I London. I was coming to that. Yes. Um, <laughs> she's drawn you in. <laughs> she has. The arbitration. India, this company, took Nigerian government to court. And I recall that in uh, the committee which was investigating this, somebody asked a very smart question. Why would Nigeria, in, especially with this new government, why would they pay, I mean, why would they reconcession this to this? Rather than paying the fine of 525 million? 
That yeah. money never existed. It was actually, uh, it was a sham, actually. It's a sham. That money never existed. It was never, Nigeria was what? never, yeah. So you before you, <laughs> that's okay. it. Okay, okay just, what, what happened? Just, just like she said, we've all read, we've all heard, we've all reported that this was a sham because there was no record of this amount at any time. All my understanding of the Ajaukta steel complex, the whole Ajaukta process, there has uh, global, global infrastructure has never, um, has never been part of the bargain for which it was expected to do. Uh, the government called in global infrastructures for four, uh, for four functions. The second was to complete, complete the structure. As at that time, I know that Ajaukta was about 98% completed. From all understanding, none of this was completed. Uh, can we? <laughs> yes, you, you can. You can yeah, um, <laughs> let's say um, not all Indians are bad. As a matter of fact, India is one of the top most economies in the world. Today. But, yes, today. Now, who we are dealing with, it's about a who owns global infrastructure in Nigeria Limited? Who is the promoter? Mind you, there are two metals. There's a the good metal, Lakshmi Metal. He owns ArcelorMittal. That's a big steel player in, in um, uh, South Africa and some part of Europe. And that's a good guy. He's the elder brother to Pramod Metal. Now, we are talking about Pramod Metal, who happens to be the black sheep in the family. And that's the one Nigeria. That is the did. one, exactly. But, however, the story I heard is Obasanjo did not know that he was dealing with the Pramod Metal. He thought he was dealing with Lakshmi Metal. But that is just the side talk. Um, like she said, sorry, what was the question again that you were? Because I was yes. trying to. Your own question. My question oh. they, they, they drew you in. I was asking mm -hmm. if that was the case, how come that the reconcession went through? Issa, you want to jump in? No, the, the, the reconcession, they, they're supposed to be uh, an agreement or a settlement which really never was. We are going to have a settlement of that in, that involves Ajakuta. There has to be some group, interested groups or stakeholders that will be involved. There should be the Meteorological Association or the Nigerian engineers. And uh, these are big stakeholders. They never were involved in anything. Anybody comes out to say there is supposed to be uh, any agreement or any settlement, or the people were never there. Even at any point in time, the ministers supposed to attend some of these meetings never went. But if either an attorney general, an attorney general decides for whatever reason, usually it has to do as we know. I'm sorry, yeah. greed, and you know. Uh, Corruption that is there. That is the basic problem of our society, of everything in us. Can I, I was sorry, mm -hmm. the, yeah, privatizing Ajauta was being handled by BP, but the concessioning was being handled by the ministry. As at that time, ICRC was not yet. Because I, 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 am, I am very sure of my political and economic history of Nigeria in the last 37 years. I am very sure of that. Where of power and steel were carrying out the concessioning, it was not actually uh, Global Steel that was the first concessionaire of Ajakuta. Okay. There was one company that... Kobe, did you when, find Kobe? Yeah, when when, when uh, late Dr. Agagu was the Minister of Power and Steel. So that company later on could not, was not performing according to all the concession. So then Global Steel came in, and they came in with the credentials of the Meta Senior. Because the credential of the Meta Senior is very strong. Uh, except, now that, except now that China, uh, Bao Steel and Hubei, Hubei Steel, they are taking over. They are doing 800 million tons of liquid steel per year now. So, uh, Tata and Mita in India. In India. India, is, India is on top. So, I wouldn't want to just sit anywhere to just write off Global Steel in terms of the CV they presented that time. It was a very strong CV. It was that 
the ministry concession Ajakuta to them. Then BP now said, look, this concession, we, we want to privatize it to core investor says, because this doing is going to go into history. And I want people to revalidate the utterances of some of us, because some of us may have a chance to go back to government, even maybe as a councillor in my local government. So any utterances I make in any public forum must be statements that can be verified and validated. That is my training. PP we now said, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Minister, we so want... So are you saying what actually happened here? Just trying to make a story sweet because... <coughs> okay. Well, I don't seem to be... Natalia, I'm so sorry. I was... Okay. I, you know, I, I, when I started this whole thing, I was trying to be very cautious because of the number of, you know, sad occurrences that happened from the last time I appeared in Arulaba. But right now that you're trying to co quote... Global infrastructure is very come out in my full no, self and tell say please, things as they are. Tell her to allow me lay the foundation yes. to where I am. But let's be very, but let's be very, but let's be very. If you're saying things, I would like to have documents of what you're going to say. The, what, the CB they presented and all of that. So the, of course we are speaking the, to Nigerians. I'm laying from the, the, that is how BP now try to now say okay the concessioning mm -hmm. by the ministry that BP is wanted to now do full scale privatization. I I hope you don't don't misquote. Global Steel was already in possession of Ajakuta. Okay. When we in BP said, look, let's do full-scale privatization, and you know why? Because the amount of money required to complete that place and to operate it, if you are holding a concession, it, it, you don't have that level of confidence. But if you are a co-investor, 1%, that means you own 51% share. Mm -hmm. You are a lawyer, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So we felt in BP that look, let's let's privatize this thing properly so that the concession frame can force to full scale privatization, maybe 70%, so it gives them comfort to attract investment. So we could not complete this. We didn't finalize this privatization before May 29. Now, what happened after May 29 to the time they now had a problem? with the new president that time which led to the to the maybe okay all those were based on the concession agreement they had with the ministry and the content of the concession agreement must be the basis because each transaction has they have contract they have content must have been what led to all the issues you are saying so you and me are not i'm not i'm not at conflict with all your own opinion but let, me, let, I am let giving you the like build on. up to the. Well, uh, like to say so, yes. I have never Andy. followed Let's global since Natasha. I left BP. I so, <laughs> so. Natasha, there's somebody you want to clarify. Yes. Um, just to make the viewers understand, let me just try to recap a little bit to where he got. Since um, Obasanjo's era seems to have a whole lot of this um, blame rolling, so it's good Nigerians know that. The very first attempt made to revive Ajakuta was in 2001, when he had a good intention. He paid a, a, a visit to one of Germany's oldest rolling mills and saw that after 40 years of being abandoned, it was revived. So the next thing he went to Russia, and it was Putin's first time in office. They had a bilateral agreement to revive Ajakuta. Based on that agreement, um, Tiaja Prom Exports, which is the original builders of the plant, they came down. They sent in 40 experts, and they worked for about three months with the Nigerians on site to develop the technical and the financial um, modalities. Yeah, modalities. After about um, a year or so, Obasanjo went silent. So Putin sent in a response, a, a letter to him, reminding him of the agreement they had and that the Russians have concluded their own part. They had negotiated it was going to cost about 400 and something mm -hmm. million dollars, and mm -hmm. then it, it, it was going to cost about 200 and something million dollars to complete both together, 600 and something, and that's okay. The Russians had even went ahead to seek it from BNP Paribas and all. Everything was in place. And then, what did the passenger do? He gave it to Solgas. Solgas was a company we were trying to recall. Solgas is a company that was brought in by Bengal passenger, no experience in steel plant. Fine, they gave them, that blow was so harsh on the Russians because they felt they were being, I mean, they had, it was the documents 
that they worked upon that Solgas thought, if I, no matter how many books, medical will not make me a doctor. And that was what Solgas, all Nigerians did not understand. They thought they were playing smart by having in their possession the technical details and the financial, uh, the, the technical financial details the Russians had prepared. That was the first mistake. Now, when Solgas had the, um, Itzak Piana Jakuta for about a year, and they could do nothing, the National Assembly had a hearing in 2003, yes, and advised them to go back to Russia and get a partnership or hand over the operations of Ajakuta and Itakpe to TPE. But they refused. Solgas went to India and partnered with Iceblatt. This same Pramod Metal was the manager of Iceblatt. So when they had, so Iceblatt, which later on became Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited, <laughs> yes, well, they actually came in partners to sell gas. And it will interest you that Nigeria did not go through any legalities or BPE modalities to actually engage global infrastructure formally. What they did was, when Iceblatt got in, you know how Nigeria, someone becomes close, you know, um, nepotism and all of that. The federal government thought that terminating that, I, that going through, why do they have to deal with Solgas when they can actually deal with ICE? So what they did was terminate the contract with, um, Solgas. with Solgas. And overnight, the very next day, engaged Global, who then suddenly quickly changed its name and registered Global from Iceblatt to Global. Do you understand? It was a very, very shady transaction. The Ministry of uh, Justice was not carried along. Nobody actually checked the capacity of global infrastructure, ice plats, global steel holdings, all these steel things. That's it. And then Nigeria, so I'm sorry, that's why I challenge you. There was no fancy documentation or CV or connection to the, prompt, to the main Lakshmi Metal. Nigerians were just hostage innocently and dragged into this wholesome greed by our leaders. Okay. The let that's me, so, so, sorry. Okay. that's uh, how we found ourselves in this mess whereby they had no capacity, they had no financing, they had no money to, comp to, to, em to embark upon operations. That they had to actually, um, they, they had, they, they, at that time in 2005, Global Steel Holdings now took possession of Delta Steel. And then they now pledged Delta Steel as collateral to secure some loans. You know, so what happened there was a series of capital flights and fraudulent uh, debt restructuring. That's it. Uh, so, like so, so, sorry. Uh, let's just take a quick break, um, and uh, we'll come right back. Um, the subject is a Jakuta steel mill. Is it possible that this huge monstrosity infrastructure can be revived? Is it possible that even our government is serious enough to want to make sure this thing works? Is there some international conspiracy somewhere? We'll deal with all that when we return. Welcome back. Of course, you are watching a very interesting, you might call that so, um, on the Ajakuta steel. Will this monstrosity be, be revived? But before we tackle some of those other nuances, there's a question I'd like to ask you, Natasha. You were credited with a letter to Nigerians, which was released, this was an open letter, December 2016, that the Ministry of Solid Minerals, Mines and Steel uh, Development lied to the president and colluded with Adoke and some others to do a deal hurtful to Nigeria and beneficial to Global Infrastructure Holdings Limited. How did you establish those facts and is this a sample of the kind of uh, shenanigans in this particular uh, uh, steel situation in Nigeria? Thank you very much, Mr. Jay, for that very direct. I didn't expect you to bring <laughs> it up, but... <laughs> well, you knew you were coming here. <laughs> I didn't expect because right from December till now, a lot has happened. A lot has happened and it has tried to curb me into my shell. But then you're trying to bring that out. So yes, let's deal with it. Um, it's true. Um, it starts from the arbitration in England. Nigeria had a very good case. We were winning Ajakuta and Itape. We were. The Indians had no hold into us. But you know, they didn't want to just let go. So the Global, Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited approached Price Waterhouse Coopers. 
They got them as consultants to try to pull in some powerful person who was close to the corridors of powers. And then Alaji Musabelo. Alaji Musabelo, he was then the son-in-law to Rewan Lukman, and he was very close to uh, the Vice President Sambo and President Jonathan. He was a man around the corridor of power. And then he now told me himself, what I'm telling you is one-on-one, -on -one, he told me that he just took advantage of Nigerians' corruption. That, that told me so, <laughs> Natasha, I, just, I know Nigeria had a good chance, but it took advantage. So what I did was I worked closely with Adoki. And now I have global infrastructure. I'm now the owner of Nigeria Limited. He took advantage of Nigeria's yes, corruption. Yes, that was it. He said it. I asked him, I was like, how can you be the owner of Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited? You were not there in the vice president's office signing. I saw Pramod Mittal and then, uh, what's his name? Um, Pramod Mittal was there. The minister, um, Fire Me, was there and others. I didn't see you. He said, Natasha, there's a system. You need to understand how Nigeria works. System <laughs> whereby ministers, governors, and VPs, everybody just play, but we who actually control the system are behind. So that was how he put it to me clearly. And I'm saying this before national, the national television because I've reported myself to the authorities. The more the security, you look, yes. the less you see. And he said yeah. that day, he said, <laughs> while they were signing, yeah. while they were signing that Pramod Mittal was just acting, that's the agreement they had, that Pramod Mittal is supposed to act and pretend to Nigerians that he still had interests and ownership in global infrastructure. Meanwhile, in reality, it, global infrastructure now belongs to Alaji Musabelo and the people he, whose well, interest is promoting. How do we substantiate that discussion? When I, I will tell this. Yes. When I, after that, I dug deep into my files right. and I discovered, I went straight. There's this report that um, the ministry submitted to the, pre to the president upon um, assumption of uh, office. I think it was... May to the, uh, June 2015, I went straight to my file and I read, and in truth, the dates, the sequence of events in which Alaji Musabelo told me that things happened actually fall, fell in place. He told me that late 2012, he had a discussion with Aduki, okay? And when I saw, in January 2013, Aduki actually got from Jonathan for an out-of-court settlement. This is what it did. Nigeria was winning the case, Ajakuta and Itakpe was going to be in the hands of Nigeria, and the Indians did not want to. So they approached Musa Bello, who now struck a deal with, with, um, with Adoke, to, to come up with a story that Nigeria was going to lose in the courts, if, or except we call for an out-of-court settlement, which we now did. Now, let's talk about the out-of-court settlement. Once he got the no, approval listen, for the out-of-court... What you're saying is true. This is the worst betrayal. It is. What's betrayal? Oh, How oh, about oh, Malabo oh. oil? It's the same thing. It's the same series. It's the, it, uh, yes, Ajak, this is a very bad betrayal, but it's the same thing that has happened. But then mm -hmm. let me draw, let, let, me, let me also say this. Let me ask you this. I want to talk about the no, 525 no, hold, million dollars, hold, hold just yeah, because. Yeah, you, don't, for, don't let I me forget get, that. Uh, I would get 525. And D to add on to that. Listen, your critics might say your interests in all of this is because of your Ukrainian background. You wanted um, the Eastern Bloc to the have Eastern it. Bloc to get this deal, and it never happened. That this was self-serving on your part. How do you defend that? You see, everything I've done is out of sheer patriotism, and it's unfortunate that patriotism is such a rare attribute right now that people don't recognize it, or they think when you're serving selfless, especially financial motive behind, there is nothing. <laughs> I'm not doing this. For the Ukrainian side, as a matter of fact, I'm, see, the Asia Prom Expert is Russian. So how can I be promoting Ukraine against Russia when there's actually this Cold War behind, between them? This is for Nigeria. I'm promoting Nigeria's interest. You see, I'm sitting here today as a direct product of the relationship between Nigeria and Russia. Russia has been the only country that has genuinely tried to transfer technology, not just physical technology, but actually transfer a lot of itself. I don't tell me, Nigeria has associated a whole lot with, I'm trying to bring outside now. Mm. Nigeria in the past 60 years has related closely with America, with, um, Britain. with Britain, with France, 
with every... Please, can you just tell me how many of Nigerians were actually trained professionally, freely, out of the nation's goodwill to go back to their country and improve in the social economic sector like the Russians? There's none. At the time the Soviet Union was here, they had trained over 3,000 Nigerian metallurgists. Mm -hmm. Is that not right? Mm -hmm. My father was a medical doctor. No, but I'm not talking about the architectural part and the other sectors. So what I'm pushing for is so that Nigeria can open their eyes and actually worldly nations that mean well for us. Let us and look at Russia what Egypt... Yes. Okay. It's unfortunate <laughs> that we tend to be lured by the aids and the droppings that we receive from the West. But China is doing that right now. If we talk about China, that's a complete different <laughs> ballgame. <laughs> China is trying to expand its territory into Africa because right. it needs a colony, a distant colony, because one, its economy is slowing down over there. Secondly, it's highly overpopulated. Thirdly, it's looking for a place where it can drop its third class citizens like ex prisoners. And Africa seems to be the most convenient place yes. to drop seen as normal citizens in China. But you see that, yep. uh, that you know, Nigerians are rushing and gravitating towards the Chinese that in is, droves. That Chinese. is, that, you, the, know? you know, Shola, that is our problem. That is my problem. Can't we, <laughs> can Russia, USSR, Ukraine was part of USSR mm -hmm. then when the DPE came in. Right. So, if we have to, the, the technology there in Ajakuta is USSR or Russia. Mm -hmm. so what is wrong with asking Russia that had the object to continue to finish this then? Is that's not you don't wrong make with sense. that. I want to say this, sir, please. I want to say this. I'm going to use Egypt right. as an example. You know, they say in life, you follow, you read someone else's history or experiences so that you avoid the pitfalls they did. Let's look at Egypt. Have you ever asked yourself why Gowon went to Russia in the first place? I'll tell you this. At the same time, in Nigeria was, at the same time Nigeria was colonized by Britain, so also was Egypt. But then the second vice president, Abed Nasser, I don't know if you heard about yep. this story. Mm -hmm. Abed Nasser had a very close relationship with Russia at that time. He realized that the West, the Americans, the French, and the British were only interested in usurping the opportunities in let, his let, country. Let, let, let me hold I'm you getting this. Okay. 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 You, you continue. Didi in chat. My passing chat is that we kindly try to use this opportunity and this platform to uh, advise government mm -hmm. to see how they can sort out all the litigations and issues surrounding national iron our mining companies and Ajakuta because they are integrated. If you give one to a separate owner and you said another owner to come and take Ajakuta, it may never happen because they are integrated. The source of raw material for Ajakuta is in Neomko. That is in Italy. The major, major source. Yeah. To a large extent, the raw material is from there. The other raw materials are going to come from all over Nigeria and even possibly from Liberia and Sierra Leone and, and uh, or even uh, outside Africa. Africa. Yes. <laughs> so you are going to bring uh, so many other things into place there. So it, it will be good for the current minister of Solid Nera to try to sit down again and review this agreement so that you, you, don't, you don't think you have sorted out a problem while created. you have created a new problem. That is my own. I, the nitty gritty of what happened between Global Steel and I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I have no privilege uh, I, I information <laughs> about it at all because <laughs> since I left BP, this transaction was Minister of Power's transaction, actually. So, so you didn't know what I don't know what happened. They got terminated and all the problems, arbitration and so on. So I, I never got involved. I'm not a lawyer. Nobody consulted me about all those things. But I still believe that this country needs steel. If we get it right politically, the economy can work. If we don't get it right politically, the economy will not work. Uh, Ruth, what is your part in shot? Well, for me, I think it should be 
So the benefits of Nigeria as a whole, if the government will uh, develop the political will to complete Ajao Kuta, I don't know about this agreement and all that, but I feel it, it, it's, it's the responsibility of completion. I was in an interview with the sole, uh, sole administrator of Ajao Kuta still just about two weeks ago. And one of the things he said was that all that is needed to complete Ajao Kuta steel plant right now is just about $400 million. With all we are borrowing, with mm -hmm. all we have in our savings, with all the loots we are getting, we'll get him back, eh? <laughs> I don't see why Ajao Kuta cannot be completed. Isa, what's your part in shot? Well, <clears throat> um, if there is um, a way we can, we should form a group that should follow her footsteps and make sure that Ajekuta is, exec is executed. That project is the fundamental project that governments must not, we should not play politics about it. Yes. No ethnicity about it, no really, yeah, because we do rubbish about things that are very essential to us. This is the most, one of the most important things we should follow. If we are going to diversify our economy through agriculture, through, uh, we should be able to add value to whatever we produce, even if we are not industrialized. And adding value to it, you can't do anything other than that. produce steel, flush it, so that you can machine tool to industry that can add value to certain to our agricultural and mineral uh, products. Thank you very much. Uh, short of naming a Jakuta, Natasha, <laughs> Mill, okay? Oh my what goodness. What is your part in shot? Ah, first, Nigeria needs to have a philosophy. What do we stand for? It has to be very inclusive. And from that philosophy, we need to determine our sovereignty as a nation so that we can determine our growth in a Nigerian manner first before any other country. When we have these two things on ground, we will now realize that the Niamco contract Recontaminated because it's null and void ab initio. The signatories to that contract have got no legality. They've got no authority to sign that. So we actually have a sham in papers. The reason why we, yeah, if we, we, we the, the minister even talked about giving it actually back to them to global infrastructure for seven years because we, we either are going to pay the five hundred twenty-five million dollars. Five hundred twenty-five million dollars never existed. It was just an agreement with some fraudulent presidential committee members in Nigeria. It was not the court in England. So the whole reconcession agreement is shorted in fraud, and it must be terminated. And like uh, Sir Don here said, it's very important that Ajakuta and Itakpe are not separated. So it's Nigeria should look for a single entity that will operate it on behalf of Nigeria. Another thing again, Nigeria should please no, not privatize, privatize Ajakuta. Yeah. It is very, very important that we do not see Ajakuta as a business. Ajakuta is an economic aid for our people. It must not be in the hands of anybody other than Nigeria. Right now, as we speak, Indian government is in possession of five of its largest steel plants. So we should also follow suit. Thank you. Well spoken. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we, we've come to the end of um, this session of summit on how to get a Jakuta steel back on track. My guests are Isa, Ruth, and Dandy. You have been great. Um, Patriots of the nation, and we just hope everybody feels the same way as you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.